Welcome to the Law Firm Growth Podcast, where we share the latest tips, tactics, and strategies for scaling your practice from the top experts in the world of growing law firms. Are you ready to take your practice to the next level? Let's get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Case Fuel Podcast. We have Michael Meyer on the show today. So Michael is the founder and owner of Picture More Business based out of Brooklyn, New York. And he's got a really, really interesting perspective, both on his business, which involves photography for law firms in a way that's really driven towards getting ROI for the firm. And also as the host of the Legal Marketing Studio Podcast, where he's interviewed some of the top experts in all areas of law firm management, from marketing to operations to you name it. So thanks again, Michael, and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Really, uh, really pleased to be here. We've kind of got the high level overview of who you are, but uh, I'd love to hear more about the story of how you got to, to where you are today. I'm not sure where I am today, but I can tell you how I got to be doing what I'm doing. <laughs> I had been doing corporate photography. I'd actually been running another photographer studio and watching the market in terms of the changes that were happening in digital. And I just thought, you know, where after I leave, because I'm gonna have to go to my own and freelance, I, I don't want to, you know, run someone else's studio forever. Where can I fit in? And, and the place where I felt like I could fit in was in the corporate world, particularly particularly doing portrait work. And so after a couple of years of kind of cutting my teeth and doing a couple of law firms for a friend of mine who builds websites for law firms, small firms, somebody that I network with because I I network a lot mentioned to me, oh, there is this group, the Legal Marketing Association, and they have a lunch next week. It is a room full of marketing people. You should maybe go. And her thinking was, oh, you want to meet marketing people and you've done a couple of law firm sites. This might Maybe this is a place for you. And I went and it was, a great room to be in. And I realized that there was a market for photography in the legal industry and that the industry wanted to be marketed to very specifically, that lawyers liked seeing that that you'd worked for other firms and that you understood their needs. And so since then, I've been not 100% focused on the legal industry, but certainly selling to the industry in a very direct way. So I've been doing that for the last several years. And really, I mean, honestly, photography for law firms is like photography for any other business business, particularly any other service business. It's just how do you tell the story and how do you make it visual? But understanding how law firms work and kind of how they see themselves, I think, makes them more comfortable. And so it it sort of hopefully gives me a leg up, but, uh, you know, time will tell. So one of the things we like to talk about a lot on the show is sort of the importance of of niching down and also kind of displaying your, your personality in an authentic way, because, you know, if you're putting yourself out as this person and somebody's coming in expecting a different person, then you might not have great situations with retention or any of that stuff. So the kind of persona that people are putting out there in law firms is absolutely dependent on how they're representing themselves online with the, the photography. So I'm sure it's, it's really important to get this stuff dialed in. But um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was this whole kind of idea that you have of small tweaks that can end up getting a law firm more business or allow them to grow or allow them to get better clients and that sort of thing. So would you mind expanding on that a bit? You and I were having a beer the other day and we got into that whole thing about small tweaks. And really, I think what it was about is is paying attention to the details. And given that my role in marketing initiatives for firms tends to be very detail oriented, I'm, I'm big on it, how the details are all put together. I think it's important that people be looking at the strategy in the big picture. I mean, that's where your focus should be. And then once you have a strategy, once you have a way of implementing it and a plan for implementing it, and hopefully you're working with, you know, professionals who are experts in in these sort of higher level strategic aspects, you know, once you've got that in place, then the details become extremely important. And I, you know, I don't have hard numbers necessarily, at least not from legal, but I I did work for a, a company that did listings in the medical field and they found some of their listings did better than other listings. And this was not just that one doctor was better than another, but they were seeing two doctors that on paper looked very similar and one would do better than the other. And when they looked at it, it was just that one of them had good photographs and the other had kind of average, mediocre photographs. So that small difference of going from mediocre photograph to good photograph really created like, a I remember the exact number, it was like a 30% bump in appointments and then a better follow through on actually going to those appointments. So being able to see somebody that detail making that detail better and really paying attention to the details has real returns. And so I think, you know, it's great that you have the strategy in place, but if you don't implement it well, if you don't make sure that each detail all the way through the process, you're not going to maximize.
maximize the potential of that strategy. So I'm not sure where I'm going with this quite, but, but, okay. I, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I do think that getting the details right and tweaking those details can really improve the performance of your marketing initiatives. Yeah. And I really couldn't agree more. So most of the world that I live in is a bit further up the funnel in terms of the traffic that's coming to. But, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot is, is conversion rate. And when you're talking about the results that you are like, essentially, you know, if you think about the uh, 30% lift in one person getting the appointments versus the other, obviously, it took someone to get to that site. But if you're looking at in the realm of online advertising, for example, you know, you can have a campaign that's going off like gangbusters. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're the equivalent of the doctor that has the bad photos, you're going to be wasting a lot of that effort because, you know, it's the same thing. There's a lot of attorneys will not hesitate for a second to invest in really expensive office space. Why? Because you're creating the impression that we have our stuff together. This is a high quality firm that you can trust and everything that you do has to support that. So, you know, when, when you're missing out on little details like that, just the smallest little bit of incongruency can, can really turn people off in, in a way that could be represented in a 30% lift or, you know, drop for that matter in, in the results that they're ultimately getting. Yeah, absolutely. And again, this is, we're not talking night and day between getting your photography right or getting the wording on your your landing page right. But that 10 or 20% bump in in return can be significant. I remember doing a project for a hedge fund, I think it was, or it was some kind of investment company. And they were like, wow, this photography is expensive. To which I responded, number one, no, it's not. And number two, if this one day of photography, if one person in the next year comes to your website and thinks, you know what, I'm not sure, but this guy looks like I trust this guy. I, you know, I, he looks like someone I can work with. If just one person is pushed over the edge, to you versus a competitor in one year's time, how much is that worth? And this guy looked at me and he kind of went, you know what? That makes sense. Yeah. If, if one person is pushed over the edge by having slightly nicer photography, then that's worth the cost. Again, all of these things, um, it can be any little detail. You know, one thing that I always, I network a lot. And one little detail that drives me crazy is when people have either cheap business cards that are glossy or they have, you know, like wax coated business cards, which seem fancy, but I can't make notes on them. That drives me crazy. You know, like that's one little detail, one little tweak that all of a sudden, if someone can make notes on the back of your business card versus they can't, it seems silly to even think about it. But in, you know, a year, two years, five years, eventually someone who might have been interested in hiring you isn't going to be able to make a note. And then it is going to make a difference. And again, um, that's almost to the point of absurdness. But I do think that these little small details throughout the marketing chain can make a big difference over time. So for on my podcast, I just had um, Josh Rosenzweig on recently. He's the j- just published actually yesterday, though by the time this goes live, it won't be yesterday. It'll be weeks ago. And I were talking about innovation. He consults with firms about innovation and the scale of a lot of these changes really amount, they're not these huge disruptive things. It's really like just smoothing any rough edge and just anything that you can do to smooth the client experience from the sales process into the intake process to the actually doing the work phase of it. Anytime you can smooth those, any little inconvenience that you can smooth over and getting them from one part of the process to the next, it's going to be time saved for you, time saved for them. And in the end, that's going to bring return to you and be better for the client. The thing is that I definitely don't think it's crazy whatsoever because a lot of the time, some of these you know big disruptive changes that, that people are going to be looking at for their business, and a lot of the time, some of the most obvious ones. So when you're focusing on these smaller details, you know not only is that something that other people might not be taking a look at, but you know in aggregate, this is kind of like a compounding effect. You know, it's it's you know similar to whatever two percent of in your bank account is going to get you a million dollars in, in whatever sort of time. You could realize that you're having a, you know hundred percent increase in maybe ten or twenty different little changes like this, and it's kind of tough and it definitely becomes more difficult to measure when you're getting the stuff that is more complex. But when you look at something, you know, if you were to ghost call one of the top firms in the country, I would bet dollars to donuts that they have a much better intake process than somebody who's a solo practitioner. And is the solo practitioner a solo practitioner because they don't have this better process? Or is it the process that's going to get them to the point where they're, they're going to actually get these better things? And I feel like a lot of people have this sort of cause effect relationship backwards, but I definitely think there's, there's a value to uh, to doing that. Yeah, let me just jump in there because I think also it's important not necessarily to compare, say, a solo to an AmLaw 100 firm because there's a lot of reasons why a solo might be a solo. And there's a lot of reasons why a partner at a small firm is at a small firm. I think the metric maybe isn't, are they as good as, say, the big firm? Because the big firms have people and budgets and time for 
for a lot of the details that smaller firms don't necessarily. I think the better comparison would be to someone, to a peer who's in the same size. So a solo to a solo or a small firm to a small firm or even solo to small firm. How well are you paying attention to all the small details in the thing, in the initiatives that you're doing? Because at the end of the day, it, you know, it's that joke about, uh, I don't know, I think this was you and I who were talking about it, right? The the, the joke about um, the two hikers. The safari. Who are, yeah, the safari, right? And, you know, why are you lacing up your sneakers? You know, you can't outrun the bear. And it's like, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun you. So, and that's what you have to do. You have to just beat your specific competition. Yeah. And call back to a previous episode that for the listeners is, you know, this is this really gels with this concept that we went over with uh, Gary Falkowicz, which is kind of, he calls it the blackjack assumption, which is, you know, in blackjack, you have to assume that the dealer's got a 10 face down. In the world of online marketing for law firms, you got to assume that they called a law firm before you and they're going to call a law firm after you. And this doesn't matter whether it's coming from a Google ad or Google organic or Avo or Yelp or, you know, even a local BNI chapter. You know, you have three business cards. I'm going to call them all and see who ends up responding the best. And if you have just a little bit more polish, then yeah, you're going to outrun that bear and then you're going to be the person that people choose. Right. Yeah. So um, moving on a little bit more into some some different tweaks. So you've had exposure to a lot of really interesting people in the legal field through your podcast. What kind of other ideas, maybe not necessarily in the, the realm of designer photography, have, have you seen that led to some big impacts in, in people that you might have worked with or, or interviewed? I mean, I think the, the one that comes to mind first, two come to mind. The first is actually an upcoming episode talking to attorney Jim Shenwick. He has this great story about recognizing an opportunity building a content marketing plan to address that opportunity and having results that are literally immediate, like same day, next day kind of results, which is a really incredible thing. But it's I think the small detail there is is that he saw an opportunity, didn't wait to get everything perfect, but realized that it was so timely, he had to be immediate and so acted really quickly. And being first essentially first to market to that opportunity was really powerful for him. The second example, going back to one of the first episodes we did, I did an interview with Arthur Levin, who's been with law firms for a long time, worked with big firms, and now does consulting and sales training for attorneys. And he was telling me this story about an attorney who was having trouble kind of figuring out how to differentiate herself. And she found this this thing where she was like, you know, he's like, well, what do you like to do? What sets you apart? And, and somehow they got to talk about like, she bakes cookies, like she's a, she's a baker, you know, and she's not working at the firm. She goes home and she bakes. And so he said, well, send a thank you note to every single client and include a few cookies. So now for every, you know, every time she has a matter and she works with a client, she sends that client a thank you and it includes cookies and, you know, nicely kind of wrapped and packaged, not professional, not store bought, but, you know, just kind of crafty. And she's just been consistent in doing that. It's just a, you know, the small detail of a thank you note, but something very personal that also makes you human and makes you relatable, I think was another good one. And those, I mean, in a way, those probably aren't the kinds of answers you're expecting in that. I mean, I feel like most people are going to go, well, how are we tweaking some small, you know, that isn't technical, it's not process oriented. But I think these are the kinds of small details that matter in getting people to trust you, to like you, and ultimately to to hire you. Yeah. and, And ultimately, it's really not something that's kind of prescriptive. Like if this is something that anyone could do, everyone would already be doing it. So it wasn't, okay, yeah, you know, like I, I got to go back home and get some baking gear so I can get cookies to my clients. But you, you have to sort of set some time aside to kind of think about how you can really show your personality into that. And, you know, I bet that everyone has some sort of an equivalent of what it is that they do that they could possibly incorporate to get a little bit more personality into their brand and potentially get attracted by better clients that, that, that might fit them personally. You know, I think it's also recognizing that other people have some of these same needs and being able to help them in the same way, I think, can be very powerful, which makes me think of um, conversations I did with Janice Rovin and Davida Perry about a women's only networking group that they run or Dana Heights and Zara Watkins on the deliberate solos group that they run. I mean, they had these needs in terms of marketing and in terms of networking that they didn't feel like were being met. And so they created an opportunity for others who had those same needs. So I think that there are certain these things that, that are important to do that don't seem like they don't seem like these big picture kind of things. They don't seem like these huge initiatives. They don't seem groundbreaking or disruptive or any of these things that, you know, you think are going to be the things that make a big difference. I think it's very often the small details. And again, that's not to say that if you don't have strategic goals, if you don't have strategic plans and really good ways of implementing on those strategies, the details aren't going to help. But assuming you do have those things, these small details are what are going to really, you know, set you apart and again, help you out run your friend so your friend gets eaten by the bear. Yeah, exactly. And, and what does anyone want if not to see their friend get eaten by? <laughs> yeah. So when we're talking about having a lot of this stuff in place, this kind of 
comes to mind with the, maybe the smaller medium firm that's it's on the, the road to growing up. And, and, you know, it's really tough because most of the people in that space are kind of in the middle of a, a 20 mile march. And a lot of the times, you know, you're hiring, you're servicing all these case files, you know, you have all kinds of stuff going on in your business. So, you know, from your experience, when do you see people really taking the time to focus on this? At what point are people usually considering changes like photography in, in their website or, or whatever sort of thing that they're doing to make a small tweak? I don't think there is a cutoff point. I think some people want to invest in it. Some people don't want to invest in it. Some people believe in it or enjoy doing that kind of thing. And so they're willing to do it. I don't think it matters what size firm it is, whether it's midsize, large, solo. I think Ethan Wall, who was on the, the Legal Marketing Studio podcast recently, you know, was talking about once you have that strategy in place and once you know what you need, then you can sort of prioritize. And again, I think that's going to be dictated both by what the strategy is, what it makes as a priority, and then all of that kind of mixed together with personal preference and comfort level with how people want to market what they're comfortable with. I'm not sure that there are generalities that can be drawn. I'm sure people would disagree with me. You know, people who are more data-driven, people like Michael Rhinowesser, he might certainly have some opinions that are more data-based, but anecdotally, my view is that it's more personality-driven in terms of how firms are, are deciding to spend their money and also what their strategy are in terms of how it, it sets priorities for them. Now, I'm um, kind of going back to the photography stuff. So, you know, you obviously have a lot of these different jobs, con consultations, you're talking to people, you're looking at their stuff. What would you say are some of the, the common things that a lot of firms are missing out with on the photography side of their business? I think the one thing that I see fairly frequently is that there's a disconnect between how they see photography and their marketing strategies. They don't necessarily tie together their visual identity with their brand identity. And I think that photography can be used much more effectively by most firms. I would say that it's a vanishingly small percentage of firms that are doing photography well. We're not trying to compete with the top ad agencies and consumer brands in terms of how they're using photography to reach consumers. But I think that there's a lot more room for improving how they're using those assets. And, and it starts with thinking through what the message is that they need to convey? And then how do we take that brand narrative and the personal narratives of each individual attorney and turn them into small visual stories? Even if it's a portrait on Seamless, you know, how we light it, how we place people, where we place the camera, all of that helps tell a story. And I don't know that firms are necessarily taking the full advantage of that. Even when I'm trying to push things, there tends to get pushback. And right. so I think there's a lot of room to push things further, but a lot of pushing it further also means that those images aren't going to last as long. And so for firms that don't necessarily want to upgrade their website every three to five years, which is really the absolute longest sites should be lasting and print collateral probably could be even refreshed faster than that. I think it's hard if you want your website to last five or 10 years, which is crazy, but not something that's unheard of, then I think then it's harder to push photography into ways that things that might start to feel trendy after mm -hmm. a few years. Right. So that's pretty interesting. So would you say that there's a trade-off between these sort of more conservative styles of, of using the photography versus something that might be more impactful in the short term? I mean, I think there's a balance between those two. I mean, I think the best example of this, but every time I go into a law firm, it's always like, well, what should we wear? And the response that I give is, you know, simple and classic is generally better than overly trendy or overly fancy or overly fashionable. Like no matter how fashionable an attorney is, and some of the attorneys I photographed are very fashionable, but if that fashion is too of the moment, then when you look at that photograph in a few years time, you're gonna be like, I can't believe I'm wearing that. That's so out of fashion. Right. You know, in legal, that's less of a concern. I mean, it is fairly conservative in terms of how people dress, but some attorneys certainly have flair. So I think the photography and the style of photography is a lot like that. I think that if you push the photography too hard, it can be in a year's time, this doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel of the moment. You know, one thing that I try to do with a lot of clients, they have their specific need. Lately, I've done a couple of publicity portraits for firms where, you know, new partners join or a managing partner has a, a press opportunity. And they say, well, while we're doing it, let's get a new photo taken. And I always try and say, well, let's not make it a photo. Let's maybe make it a mini press library. Let's try and do like five or 10 photos because today this very stark portrait on white might be really great. Tomorrow, you might want a more kind of environmental editorial kind of feeling photograph. And maybe you've got an opportunity, a rare random opportunity for something a little bit more fun. Maybe you want something more fun and you want to have these, you know, different things for all of those. But you wouldn't necessarily want to have any of those three 
as your main, say, attorney portrait on the website, unless it was a very specific kind of firm or a very specific kind of attorney. That's why I think it's a a difficult kind of trade-off between pushing the photography into more interesting places versus making sure that those images then are going to last. For a, a website or a piece of collateral that's going to last more than three or five years at most, it's harder to push sort of the, the photography in interesting ways. Gotcha. Well, it's kind of interesting. So you've identified sort of a second space that a lot of attorneys n- might not be thinking of. And, and, you know, when you're having these events that are happening at any point, when you have the ability to tell a story, it's, it's another opportunity to sort of assert your niche, assert your position. And having these kind of exercises might be something that that people are listening to that uh, might want to consider if they haven't before. And the other thing is, you know, you just brought something up and, and it's shocking that I haven't actually <laughs> heard that figure in, with uh, given my career in digital marketing, but three to five years is the most that you should be having your website. So if, if that's something that's a given, you know, maybe push things in a little bit more of an interesting direction, because if you're going to be refreshing it in, in three years, this isn't going to have to be the, uh, the oil painting that's going to be hung in your manor three generations from now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a good opportunity for some people. You know, when I think of my role as a photographer, though, you talk about it doesn't have to be this oil painting is going to last, be in the family home, you know, and that's true. But it's funny, I do think of myself a little bit like a court painter in making these photographs, because you are trying to make these people almost larger than life in a way. And you are trying to highlight all of the good things and tell a story. In a way, they are like those... <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that maybe they're directly the opposite of what I said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, I think I, your point that it's not like that picture shouldn't be forever. You shouldn't think of the photographs as forever. I, I think that's that's exactly right. As far as kind of, I mean, so we've skirted around this for a little bit, but I want to dig a bit deeper into this whole concept of conveying a story and conveying personality. So, you know, obviously you have a process that you're using to help elicit what somebody is trying to convey in terms of, of who they are as a person. Would you mind taking us through some of the questions you might ask a clients and some of the questions they might be asking themselves when they're thinking about what direction to go in for this? I think a lot of this starts not with me asking these questions. I think a lot of this should be starting with the branding and marketing folks. I think at that point, all of the things that inform, say, a website or any other collateral piece or or the guidelines set forth for, say, a social media campaign or a content marketing campaign, I think that's where a lot of these things get set. And I think my role is primarily to to then translate them into in very visual ways. So I think those questions really should be starting with at the brand and strategy level in terms of who this firm is, what their personality is, how they want to be seen, and then sort of their tolerance for risk in terms of being adventuresome in in the images that we make. I think those are really the place that we start. And they break down sort of to, you know, how formal or informal does that firm want to appear? To what degree do they want to be personable versus tough? I think those are the kind of questions that, that you want to ask. And it's also difficult, I think, also with firms where you have not only sort of the firm wide brand, but then you sort of have each attorney's personal brand and personal practice. And so if you have a a firm that has, say, some hardcore litigators in it, but then maybe also some transactional attorneys, and even it could be between transactional attorneys in different industries, I think you're going to find that it's difficult to have a single style that fits everybody. And so there kind of has to be a little bit of give and take on that style so that the firm brand should be consistent. But there's enough give and take that each personal brand, each attorney's practice brand within the firm can also be authentic and honest to what it is that they do and what it is they need to communicate to their clients. Right. So, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of nuance in this. And you know, this is clearly something that you take a very thoughtful approach to. So when somebody might be considering this kind of thing, what kind of questions should firms be asking themselves in terms of working with somebody that can get a message that will can convey their, their firm appropriately? How do you find somebody who's going to work with them to this level? In terms of photography or on the brand side? In terms of photography, let's frame this in, in terms of somebody who's looking to hire a photographer. Like, how do you separate the person who's going to take all of this this effort into to figuring out what you're about than, you know, some college kid with a DSLR? I mean, the easy answer is they should just call me. <laughs> that's yeah. A less flip answer would be, you know, I think... I mean, I have another flip answer, which is the second flip answer, would the be. second flip answer, which will lead to the real answer. The second flip answer is, you know, if you look at, at a photographer's website, do they have a, a section of personal work? And if they do, are there any sunsets in it? If there are sunsets in it, you probably should run the other direction. But I think that's really the non flip answer is really, I think, look at the photographer's portfolio and look at their personal work, especially if they have it and just see how to what degree they're thinking about the medium 
conceptually to what degree they're looking at the medium, not just as sort of a, a widget that they can sell. You know, I know a lot of, I do have competitors in the space. And in fact, I'm a small fish, even in legal. I'm a very small fish. I have no pretensions at being a big fish. But, you know, I think looking at the other photographers that I compete with, I would say there's a couple who are like me who have sort of this interest in the fine art aspect of it, who have this grounding in the theory behind a lot of the, you know, the making of images. And there are others who are very much commercial and commercial in a very commoditized kind of way. And that can be useful, especially if you've got a firm that has offices in 12 countries and 40 cities. Well, okay, maybe you do need that commoditized you know, provider who can work in all of those places. It's going to be difficult to get me to do that. I mean, I'd be happy to because that's quite a few days of shooting. I'm happy to do that. But, you know, I think that there are certain situations between firms where there are logistical issues that might push you to that commercial guy. But for the the solo attorneys, for small firms, even for medium-sized firms, especially if you're in a relatively small geographic area, you're not kind of all over the country or all over the world. I think it does make sense to look for a photographer who has their own eye, who has their own vision. And if you say, show me the photographs that you make, they're not going to come back to you with just attorney headshots. I mean, clearly it's good to see those. And I show those on my website, my commercial site. I have a personal work site also. But when attorneys say, what are you working on? I'm going to have a crazy answer about what I'm working on. Even my relatively straightforward personal projects have sort of these weird aspects to them that are very conceptually driven by the medium itself. So I think looking at the extent to which a photographer engages with the medium, thinks about the medium, is really going to tell you whether or not they can put forth something that's interesting, new, different, that sets you apart. That said, you certainly should be looking at a site that shows technical competence. And if they don't have commercial work that's up to the standards that you want to be seen as part of, well, then I don't know if I would believe that they can do it for you if they haven't done it for others before. Kind of circuitous answer that doesn't quite... (laughs) doesn't quite answer it. I would say no, that was that was quite thorough. And it's like, you know, I, I tend to live a little bit more in the left brain world with the, the flips and switches and the online marketing stuff. But you know, getting your perspective on, on what really makes this is, is certainly helpful to me. And I believe would be helpful to, to people who haven't really considered this in so much depth before. But um, yeah, no, that's 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 super helpful. And again, it's like, you know, when we're talking about small hinges that swing big doors or these little these little details, it's like, you know, when you have that personality, this it's it goes down through every level of what you do, including the kind of decisions that you're making to potentially work with someone. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot of small details and it's, you know, it's funny. I was, I did a a talk for NYCLA as part of a, a panel on branding with a design shop branding, a you know, branding company, there was a, a copy editor and a, an SEO, SEM guy and an attorney talking about the ethics of each of these kind of components. And for my portion of it, I just showed a series of portraits of attorneys on white seamless. So a white background, essentially the same light, the same equipment that I brought, but each one was subtly but significantly different. And just having that understanding that changing the light, changing the, the degree to which things are contrasty or flat in terms of the light, where the light comes from, how much shadow you allow, whether the camera is eye level or below eye level, you know, you can shift sort of how people appear and not just physically, but I mean, like our emotional response to them. And, you know, that's just working with one single background and one particular kind of studio setup. I think that's why it's important to think about how a a person approaches the medium conceptually and the extent to which they're technically savvy, because being able to control the medium and then having an understanding of what those changes means emotionally and conceptually, I think you want both of those things together. So that's why it's important to see both the commercial work that shows that a photographer can do what you want them to do, but also can think for themselves and really apply the medium to your particular story. Yeah, absolutely. And like, look, with just that one example, you can create a lot of different responses with, with that just one aspect. But I mean, you're dealing with dozens and dozens of these different things. And you know, the reality is that anything that's a creative space like photography is, is going to be an extremely complex field. And, you know, I kind of see some pushback. And this is really true of any business, including the law. You know, sometimes people think that there's just you know, it's very straightforward ways to do things and it's things are commodities. But, you know, if you're really looking to make an impact, you know, you're looking to make a difference and and, you know, you can't just take these things from any single person because they, they don't really have the level of complexity to, in understanding the problems or to really create the results.
result that you want. And ultimately, you know, it, it's asking questions like this of yourself and of the people that you're working with that's going to lead to the results that end up, you know, adding up to make a big difference in your business. I think that might be a good place to wrap up. So before we wrap up, let me just note that the commodity aspect of it is also important. The professionalism of the person that, that you're looking at, whatever the vendor is, whether it's a photographer or any other vendor, you know, how smooth do they make it for you? What does their client experience process look like? How easy is it for them to communicate with you? How easy is it for them to understand the estimates or the bills? So I think those are super important also. And if you don't feel like you can communicate with that vendor right off the bat, I mean, that might be a, a red flag. So I, I think you do want someone who's creative and technically skilled and can do these things and think the way that they need to to make the images. But they also have to be able to support your business as a business, as a provider of a commodity in a sense. So I think it's important also to make sure that you're working with a professional. Yeah, and no that, prima donnas. <laughs> no prima donnas and no, you know, no college kids with cameras who don't know how to service a client. Yeah, absolutely. If people are looking to get in contact with you for photography or to uh, listen to your podcast, what's the best way to find you online? Not through Google. <laughs> 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 tough, tough for the Michaels out there, isn't it? It's, well, it's tough for the Michael Myers. There's at least one other Michael Meyer who's a photographer down in Florida who does weddings. So Googling me is not the best way, probably. But no, picturemorebusiness.com is the best way to, to see the work that I do. And legalmarketing.studio is the best place to find the podcast. But you can also find the Legal Marketing Studio on iTunes or SoundCloud or Google Play, you know, all those places. Hey, Michael, thanks again for providing so much valuable expertise. Uh, I hope people are considering the, the little effects that they're going to have in their business. And um, until next time, this is the Case Fuel Podcast. Yeah, thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. For show notes, free resources, and more, head on over to casefuel.com slash podcast. Looking forward to catching up on the next episode.